Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to a brand new episode of Corpse Club, the official podcast for DailyDead.com. My name is Heather Wixon, and for this week's episode, I am joined by Eugenio Ercolani, as we are going to be discussing uh, William Freakin's Cruising, as well as Eugenio's new book, which is on uh, cr- William Freakin's Cruising. Um, and if you've been reading along with Daily Dead over the last year, Eugenio has done some really fantastic pieces for us. Uh, so first of all, Eugenio, thank you so much for joining me today. This is really great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Glad yeah. to be here. Yes, glad to have you. Um, it's it's been a real pleasure to see your your uh, your writing over this year. Um, it's really. You know, I'm really proud of everybody on Daily Dead, um, but there's something really fantastic about your interviews um, and your perspectives. You. So, first of all, thank you for that. Thank you. It's been it's been wonderful um, uh, working for Daily Dead. I really enjoyed the experience. Well, we have enjoyed having you, um, and it's great because so we we are going to talk about your your book on cruising um, because that's what we're here to do. This in your book comes out later this month. Um, but what I want to talk about initially is also um, your previous book, which was called Darkening the Italian Screen, um, which I will be totally, I will totally admit that um, it was part of the reason I wanted to do Halloween on Daily Dead this year, because I have been just really fascinated kind of going into this history of Italian cinema. And I know specifically Jalo is like this one little sort of subset of it. Um, but for anybody out there, if you're interested in Italian uh, cinema, this Eugenio's book is really fantastic and really a fascinating and informative read. Um, so, I mean, it's the fact that you've put out like two books within like a year or so is pretty damn impressive because I can't get myself together and I'm still working on trying to get the next one out. So that's amazing. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, Darkening was released, yes, about roughly about a year ago, but um, to collect all those interviews took quite some time. So uh, it it feels like really like, you know, feet having managed to uh, get it all together and out there. Um, so, yeah, no, it's... Um, it, it was really a labor of love that book. Um, it's not. It's not perfect. Uh, I read it. I read it again. I had to read it again for um, for an interview some time ago, um, for the very first time since it was published. And it has a roughness to it. I guess you know it was my first book. But I think it's. Um, um, it, if I can say so myself, I think it does add a perspective on popular Italian cinema or genre cinema. Um, which which you don't usually find. I think there's a kind of um, a candid perspective um, and kind of an, honest, an honesty to it, which um, which you usually you usually don't find in these sort of books. I mean, plus um, it's it's a it's a book that probably could not be repeated. Actually, it definitely could not be repeated. I mean, since um, I started working on it. Uh, several of the people I interviewed are not with us anymore. Um, I mean, there were, I mean, all all the, the, the people interviewed for the book were fairly old and, you know, some just, uh, uh, Giorgio Capitani was hitting 90 when I interviewed him the very first time. So it's, um, yeah, it was kind of re- my very last chance to do that book. Um, it wouldn't be possible now, not with the same people. Um, so yeah. It's um, uh, for who doesn't who is not familiar with the book. It's basically um, every chapter is dedicated to a different director. Uh, we go, we proceed chronologically on the basis of their debut behind the camera as a director. Uh, we start with, in fact, Giorgio Capitani, uh, who made his debut in 1952, and then we reach the late 60s uh, with. Um, uh, Sergio Martino, uh, which, uh, speaking of Gialli, is you know one of the uh, masters of that uh, of that current. And um, but we focus on all their films, you know, not necessarily the ones of the fifties and sixties. Uh, in fact, Deodato Ruggero Deodato, who many know, of course, for Cannibal Holocaust. We talk about Cannibal Holocaust, about his eighties films. Uh, in fact, we even reach his very last film, which he made two years ago. Ballad and Blood. So we touch all the um, the basically all the, all the filmographies of these uh, directors, um, 
but they were all born, artistically speaking, in the 50s and 60s. And so we, we, we managed to kind of photograph the, really the, the, the birth of uh, popular Italian cinema, um, commercial genre cinema, as I say. And, um, and yeah, no, it's, um, it's, there's an essay introducing the director, the period, the historical period, and then a career interview with them. And it's, um, yeah, I, 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 McFarland managed to, uh, you know, they, they, they published everything. They, they didn't ask me to cut, maybe, I know we did cut something with Umberto Lenzi. You know, Umberto Lenzi is completely, un, was completely unhinged. Uh, you know, he, he would never censor himself. Um, and we had to cut a couple of things there. But apart from that, we kept everything. I mean, the scandalous, the wild, the, you know, the, 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 the criminal activities, everything. And, um, and, uh, so it's, it's pretty outrageous, uh, I would say. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, um, it's a book, of course, I'm, I, you know, I'm very close to. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Sergio Martino because he was one of the directors that I was like, I really wanted to dig into. And I just never quite had the quote unquote excuse to do it. Um, so I was really happy to sort of do that in, in October. Um, and I had a chance, I only got a chance to watch uh, Torso and mm -hmm. uh, Your Vice is a Locked Room. Um, but he's a really fascinating filmmaker. Um, and I was immediately drawn in by his style. Um, and I also really appreciate it because I think for a lot of us who live maybe over here, who in the States, like when we think Italian cinema, like, of course, because we're kind of basic, immediately we go to Dario Argento, which there's nothing wrong with that. Dario is amazing. Um, but I, what I loved about this book is that it wasn't, it was all the, and like, you know, we know Lindsay and, 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 and Diodato and things like that, but like to really go into some of these directors that don't get talked about nearly as much um, that's to me what was the fascinating part of it because it was just it really opened me up to a lot of a lot of, a lot of talent that I just probably wouldn't have like I don't want to say paid attention to but I don't know that they would have really stuck out to me as people I should be paying attention to um, so that's what I really appreciated from my perspective. No, I'm 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 happy about that. I mean, it, some of the names in the book might not be. Uh, famous or well known, even in Italy, uh, let alone in the States. But um, actually, you'll find those names in um, so many films. I mean, one of the one of the people interviewed for the book, and he has a chapter all dedicated to to his work, is Franco Rossetti. And um, Rossetti is not a famous name as a director. He hasn't really left. Uh, a deep mark within any genre, although he was a more than competent director. Uh, but as a writer, and in fact, in the interview, we dig in a lot into his um, into the films he scripted. Uh, he's responsible for. He's the main writer responsible for Django, the original Django uh, by Sergio Corbucci, uh, which is, I mean, any fan of Italian westerns knows. I mean, Django's. I mean, even I think it transcends even the the genre. I mean, uh, Django Unchained. Um, Tarantino's film really kind of uh, gave it a real a big boost, and I think it's now a you know considered a, um, a classic, um, uh, even for even for people who are not necessarily familiar with the um, with Italian uh, spaghetti western. So, so I mean these these directors and and writers really did a lot um, and kind of managed to to enter the folds of popular culture much more probably than we realize because we might not we might not be familiar with uh, with their names but actually their work is out there and it's influencing a lot of people and we end up even maybe talking about them uh without knowing them so um so yeah no uh, Sergio Martino you mentioned Martino I mean Martino is um, one of the great giallo directors in my opinion I think he's He's fantastic, um, and um, he he has been often um, kind of uh, compared to Dario Argento, which I think is 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 unjust, and I think it's also wrong. I mean, they have 
very different perspectives. I mean, first of all, the erotic aspect of things. I mean, Sergio Martino definitely had a more uh, more carnal, uh, more erotic, more sensuous uh, um, approach to the giallo, whereas Dario Argento, to really find sexual overtones in his films, we have to we have to reach Tenebre. So we have yeah. to reach the early eighties. I mean, until then, uh, of course, there were female characters and there were love scenes, but it was all very much more cold and detached in that aspect of things. Whereas Martino was much more carnal and often, um, and it's also a very recognizable cinema. We He uses the same actors very often. We have George Hilton, um, Edwin Schwernick, of course, um, uh, and there are other actors, maybe in other genres. I mean, for example, in police thrillers, we we see Luc Merenda um, popping up often. Um, and of course, he had then a lot of character actors he would use in these films, Carlo Alighiero. Um, the music would often be by Bruno Nicolai. So there's there's a lot of elements that make, you know, both visual and conceptual, that make his, his films extremely recognizable. Um, but there are lots of it, um, of um, giallo directors which are extremely interesting. I mean, Antonio Bido, uh, Daily Dead published my my interview with him recently. Uh, only directed two, but I think he he really had a personal approach to the genre, especially with the second film, Solamente Nero, uh, Bloodstained Shadow. Um, and uh, uh, Luciano Ercoli, Emilio Miraglia, they all had. A, different approach to the genre. Um, I mean, Dario Argento is, is, of course, is not just one of the directors. He is crucial because he really, he did something um, which, um, um, which is actually, is actually uh, changed a lot of things uh, within Italian cinema in general. Um, there was a, a, a perception uh, among Italian producers that certain kind of films were only credible to the Italian public if they were placed uh, logistically out of the country. In fact, um, Italian Italian gialli proceeding in that Argento were often set in France, in exotic places, they were, they were elsewhere. Um, and that Argento uh, really kind of showed that these films were credible within the Italian landscape, within the Italian cities, uh, that Italian policemen were credible. Um, he, you know, he he kind of made them more Italian, really, which is what also Sergio Leone did with Westerns. He made them uh, Italian. He said, no, no, we can apply our national identity on Westerns. Um, before then, um, for example, Italian Westerns, they tended to be much more um, derivative and more imitational products of the American, of the American uh, approach. And the same with Gialli. I mean, of course, the Umberto Lenzi and Romolo Guerrieri Gialli preceding, um, preceding Dario Argento are good films. There's, there are some really good films, especially Umberto Lenzi, Orgasmo, um, Paranoia. I mean, they're they're solid. They're solid jolly, uh, but they tend towards much more the French approach. Uh, Clouseau, uh, Le Diabolique, that sort of um, that sort of approach. There, um, Dario Gento really said, "No, we can have a more marked Italian, Mediterranean, Latin touch to these. We can play around with the genre," and and so I mean, all these. The other directors, Martino, Bido, Luciano Ercoli, Miralli, and all, and there are also others, really owe to him the fact that he showed the way. Then they all found their their own voice within the genre, but Dario Gento really uh, changed the game radically there. Yeah, I mean, he was he was my first um, sort of exposure to Italian cinema, and I am grateful for that because you know I really had never seen anything like that. And I, I think I even wrote in my piece uh, about Tenebra, um, which wasn't very academic in its structure. Um, it just sort of came from a, a, a sort of a fan standpoint. But I, I like my I remember because I grew up watching this movie called Terror in the Isles as a kid. 
And so it was like my, my mission as a kid to rent every movie that's featured in there. Um, and they do have a few snippets of Suspiria. So I rented Suspiria at age eight, which is not what you should be renting when you're eight years old. And I remember watching it with my best friend and we, we were traumatized. Like she still reminds me of it to this day. Um, but I just remember being so struck by how different it felt from anything that I had seen at that point. Um, and it really was sort of like the gateway. So I never want to like discount Argento because, you know, I feel like his, his, the things that he has contributed are immeasurable. Um, but he is sort of the, I, I guess for us over here in the States, he's kind of like the easy gateway into Italian cinema, but it really, again, what I loved about doing Halloween, it just really was, it was a, I was able to like, explore all these other filmmakers um and it just made me want more of like i kind of you know right now i'm sort of in holiday mode but i'm like i still have like 15 or 16 different movies that i didn't get to last month where i'm like oh my god i really got to get to these um but yeah it's just it's really a fascinating thing and i think um again that's what i really appreciated about the book um and reading your writing you know over the the, the things that you wrote for us for Halloween, especially um because i didn't really know uh, antonio Beto. Um, you know, and you mentioned like he only had two films. Um, and I think for me, like that's, you know, some people would sort of gloss over him because he's, his contributions in retro, you know, in comparison, maybe seem quote unquote minor. Um, but I think recognizing all the talents is important. Um, and I think that's what I really appreciated about it was that, you know, somebody out there who maybe only knows like a handful of those directors, you know, might turn around and be like, you know, what is this? Um, so again, it was just, it's, it's been an education, I should say. <laughs> Great. No, no, I'm, 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 um, I'm happy. I mean, what, uh, what my, my main objective was to do something that, um, was first of all, not, uh, didn't come out from fandom. I, I, I completely removed myself from, um from the book i didn't want i didn't want to um kind of uh, point one film rather to than another i didn't want to uh use stars or you know little balls say what's good what's not what director deserves more attention i just really wanted to place it there um i chose each director because i thought um each one had a you know, some direct, some of the directors in the book were born as screenwriters. Some were more intellectual, came from more kind of the Roman intelligentsia. Others were more kind of trench men um, that really came from uh, second units and ADing and really kind of were very technical. Um, so I, I wanted different voices of different directors, all kind of marked with this. Um, with this kind of um, um, ambiguous uh, label of being genre directors, which in in Italy uh, is is always has always been perceived as something negative to be a genre director. Uh, it's something that uh, in in America, for example, you in the states, you you tend to judge a film on the basis of its um, its artistic merits, full stop. May it be a drama or may it be um, a thriller or Western, doesn't matter. Whereas here, um, there's much more of a kind of, um, of a, there's a different a different uh, politics when it comes to judging films and, and the genre basically indicates uh, if, if the film is worthy. So if it's a horror, if it's a thriller, if it's a giallo or Western or perceived as something that is probably going to be pure entertainment, then it's not worthy of any particular critical attention. And that's why, I mean, probably if um, if Mario Bava um, had was had been born in, in the States, he would have uh, he would have been considered a, one of the greats um, of his generation, whereas here he's just one of the many directors of that period doing gothic horror um and again uh, probably if hitchcock had been born here he would have been considered you know just a genre director so it's um it's um yeah so it's uh, really kind of just placing every every director there and seeing how their careers intertwined um in fact 
what I what I think spontaneously happened with the book is that people that have died many years ago are present uh, in a very three dimensional way. I mean, uh, Thomas Millian, uh, Lucio Fulci, or Mario Bava, or Riccardo Freda, uh, all key key uh, protagonists of that particular era. Um, well, different periods, but let's say within popular cinema, they're all present in the book because every person interviewed talks about them in, di- in a different way. So portraits kind of emerge from the from the pages of the book. So, um, so yeah, no, it's um, it's um, I'm glad you liked it, and I, uh, you know, I, I hope it it reaches more people and um, more people discover these films. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I like what you said about terms of sort of um, those directors' places, you know, in terms of how they sort of fit into everything, um, which I guess is a good segue into cruising. Uh, because mm-hmm. what I really appreciate about the book, um, which for those of you listening at home, um, there this new book, uh, which is basically, it's just titled Cruising. Um, it's under the Devil's Advocates series of books, uh, which comes out November 30th is a collaboration between Eugenio and is it Marcus Stiglegger? Is that how you say it? Yes. Yeah. All right, correct. cool. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty solid at the, the difficult last names. Um, dives into William Friedkin's uh, Cruising, which came out in 1980. Um, and what I really appreciated about was the back and forth that you guys have in terms of, you know, you take a chapter, he takes a chapter. Um, and it really brings a lot of different perspectives to this work at, uh, by Friedkin in particular. And I like the fact that, you know, beyond looking at it and where it existed um, while it was being made in 1979 and being released in 1980, you guys also sort of look at it and how it fits into Friedkin's filmography as well in terms of, you know, his earlier works, you know, with French Connection and, and The Exorcist and also some stuff like Jade and To Live and Die in L.A., um, and I'm curious, was this something, was this something you guys were approached to do? I'm curious how this all sort of came together initially. Well, um, actually, uh, me and Marcus, I mean, we, we, we met, uh, we met uh, many years ago. Uh, I mean, because what, what I, uh, one of my main activities is doing, um, uh, interviews, video interviews for, uh, DVDs and Blu-rays. Uh, speaking of Jolly, I'll just add this, that I've just finished working on the extras for Crimes of the Black Cat by um, Sergio Pastore, which is being released by Colden Films. And that's a giallo that is probably not a great giallo, but it's definitely it's definitely worth worth a watch. And the, the master in it is wonderful. And anyway, um, I so I was I was um, presenting a documentary I I had made called Band Alive in um, Germany about Italian cannibal movies and we met and we became uh, friends right away and we were kind of we've always wanted to do something regarding uh, BDSM culture in films and we were kind of. Mm, mm, kind of throwing out various ideas, maybe kind of European films um, in which BDSM comes to play and um, the different perspectives and, uh, and you know, Fifty Shades of Grey kind of opened up, um, kind of made BDSM mainstream in a terrible way because it's a complete uh, travesty of, of what <laughs> the BDSM, BDSM culture really stands for. And I mean, there are, Ter- they're terrible books and films, but we thought it was interesting in that moment because the books had just come out, the E.L. James books, uh, that to kind of tackle seriously the subject. We ended up kind of focusing on cruising. We realized that there was nothing out there about really, I mean, not definitely not a book about this this film. And uh, Marcus one day calls me up and says, auto publishing are interested in a book on cruising. And I went, cool, let's go for it. And uh, and yes, we we also not only we wrote it together, but we also decided to do something that is usually not done, which is to put our initials at the end of each chapter. Usually when two people or more uh, write a book together, um, not necessarily are the chapters marked. Um, usually just write, you know, each person writes a section or whatever. Um, and in fact, even even John Atkinson, uh, our editor, asked us, you know, what, are you sure you want to 
you you put your initials at the end of the chapter. I mean, it's not usually done, but we thought it would be a tool. You know, it, if you you can ignore them to just two letters at the end of each chapter, but if you want, you can actually kind of reconstruct exactly the different theories. Yeah. Uh, you know that kind of um, each each one of us kind of tags along and you know develops as the chapters proceed. So yeah. Um, uh, so I'm glad you 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 like that. Uh, me and Marcus have you know we really have different perspectives on many things, and I think we have two different styles, but we found our our way to combine them, and I think it it works. Uh, you know, in in my modest opinion, I mean, I think it it that aspect at least works. Yeah, no, definitely, and I think you know, especially now that we're 40 years removed from the release of Cruising. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of things that you can look at, you know, with this movie, um, and sort of recontextualize it in where we are today in society. Um, and it's interesting to me because I, I mean, I guess, obvi- you know, obviously there would be a lot of controversy around this movie. Um, you know, perhaps I was, you know, naive growing up realizing that, you know, to me, the most controversial movie was like Silent Night, Deadly Night. Um, so, you know, there's obviously <laughs> things I missed growing up. Um, But I think it's a really fascinating film because for as much as I understand the controversy around it, um, there's something really inherently raw about this movie um, where it, you know, it's, and I think you guys even mentioned this in the book where it sometimes it feels very like sort of documentary like, Um, and I don't feel you know, in, I don't feel like Free can set out to make a movie to piss off the gay community. Um, and it's so interesting to me that they, that that community really rose up uh, in 1979, because I didn't realize like how vocal they were, especially in New York, because I grew up in the Midwest. So I kind of was away from a lot of that stuff. Um, in terms of they like, you know, and I thought that was really interesting how they just tried to do everything possible to thwart this movie at every turn. Um, and I think ultimately that's what makes it really interesting is that because of the, that those efforts, Free can kind of had to do things with this movie that he had never done before. Like, you know, I, with there's a chapter that kind of goes into the sound and having to do the recordings and stuff like that. Um, and to me, I think sometimes adversity is the mother of necessity in a way where, you know, it's not a great circumstance to have to make your film under, but ultimately something really masterful comes out of it in the end. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. Um, I, I've had an ambivalent relationship with Cruising. I, I, I love the film now. And um, although, again, even in this book, we, we really didn't want to make, we, we wanted to make something that was more, um, it was accessible, but had more of an academic analytical approach. We did not want to make, you know, um, a kind of, a, we didn't want to have a fan approach to, to cruising. Uh, and so we, we kind of analyzed it as objectively as possible, uh, really kind of telling its stories and taking out theories. Uh, but at the beginning, when I first saw the film, I had an ambivalent relationship with it. Um, and I can absolutely see where the controversy is really, you know, um come from um it's definitely it's definitely a naive film in many ways or at least the naivety stems from Friedkin's approach to the um um to the subject at hand uh but I do believe that uh, he said this many times and we quote him um uh, at least three times in the book saying similar things he didn't really want it he didn't really think uh, and I think he he realizes that the, the kind of naivety behind this reasoning, but he didn't really think there was anything scandalous about uh, setting um, a film within this very specific part of the gay community. Um, and I know, you know, from Al Pacino's in very few but precious interviews he's given about the film, he as well, they, there was never really the sense of... Uh, a dangerous uh, minefield territory. I think they felt safe because it was set in such a specific uh, world in such a specific um, realm. And um, and yeah, but no. Uh, ultimately, 
Um, the other, I think the other aspect of, of the film, which is controversial is, and I think Marcus does this really well in his chapter. This is in which he kind of talks about um, uh, cruising as a possible horror film uh, and not as a kind of a, an investigative uh, drama thriller. Um, and I think he, he calls his chapter Wandering Demon is this idea of the serial killer not actually being people, but being more of a spirit, a spiritual dimension that possesses um, various various different uh, men and like using using them nearly as a host and making them do these horrible murders. And I think that also is a controversial aspect because, you know, is is Friedkin talking about homosexuality and and as as something demonic? But I think it, there's a lot of naivety within this film as well in the way it's ta the things are tackled. Um, but um, but I, but ultimately, I I I think it's more much more about um, being fascinated with a certain world. Um, I mean, you can tell the way Friedkin directs the, she the scenes in the mine shaft that there is really this kind of lingering curiosity, the way the camera moves around bodies and 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 neon neon lights flashing and and even sexual sexual acts like um, like fisting and uh, uh, and then the whole handkerchief code, the way you know the way Friedkin really observes is more out of curiosity, nearly anthropological curiosity in trying to dissect this world. Um, and in doing so, yes, as, as I was saying before, he, he is probably naive. I mean, the film definitely can be, you know, considered um, uh, naive in many ways. I mean, especially in 1980, the gay movement was being very vocal, quite rightly. Um, and, they, and there were a lot of attempts to, um, uh, to try to um, uh, set, you know, to have, uh, um, throw the bright light, kind of put some, you know, the, the the gay lifestyle and 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 gay men under the right light for what they actually were, and not for the you know the various perceptions of uh, uh, puritanical America. Um, so, and and to do a film in 1980. That kind of ignored the uh, human rights um, um, uh, kind of uh, battles of the gay community is probably naive, and I think William Friedkin has kind of maybe not this explicitly, but has kind of talked about this naivety. But the film definitely is an incredible document of that specific world, and and in fact, many people. Uh, I've I've talked to as well from that generation who lived that uh, the mine shaft and uh, the cockpit and and really kind of dug into that world and lived that world. Uh, they talk about the film as being very accurate and being you know a, a, a photograph of that specific world and and moment in time. So it's uh, the film is is very is, is many things. It's naive. It's uh, it's crude. Um, um and ultimately but ultimately it's fascinating you know is it a perfect is cruising a perfect film it isn't it isn't a perfect film it's a very experimental film uh it's very brave and naive at the same time um but in being all these things the, the result is fascinating i mean uh, imperfection is fascinating when there is an intelligent eye uh, that's curious when there's when there are ideas you know, they might not combine always perfectly, but the results are always fascinating if, um, you know, if there's um, a curious eye behind those decisions. And I think Cruising is this. It's, um, it's an imperfect, fascinating film that definitely has something to say and has become a document. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I think a lot of that also really comes through uh, in Pacino's character, Steve Burns, um, in terms of the naivete that he has going into this. Um, and what I, and again, I, I think any reading of this movie is valid. So my reading is probably gonna be a lot different than yours than anybody else, like other people out there. Um, but in some ways it almost feels like sort of this indictment of heterosexuality um, and the fact that, you know, 
and this is something that's sort of been discussed a lot more these days is how sexuality can be sort of on a spectrum where, you know, it's not just black or white where, you know, people aren't, you know, it's okay to, to, you know, sort of kind of move back and forth a little bit because it's not just, you don't have to put sexuality into a box. Um, and for me, I thought that was really interesting to make this movie 40 years ago and sort of kind of explore that in a way with the character of Steve um, and sort of his kind of experiences going into this world because we get a sense, you know, that he's, you know, obviously sort of being consumed by this assignment that he has like through his work. Um, but how it's, you know, obviously taken over his personal life. Um, and I think it's really interesting how, like, for so much of this movie, he is, like, sort of this silent observer in a lot of ways, where he's watching, you know, he's doing the police work, but I think, you know, ultimately it's it's kind of really awakening things in him. And I think one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when he finally goes out there and dances. Because so many of those scenes, you know, in the mineshaft are really dark. They're really foreboding. But it's, there's, there's a real sense of heaviness to them. And I think, and maybe I'm wrong on this, it's like the one scene I remember in those scenes in particular where like the lights come up and everything is illuminated for Steve. Um, and I think for me, that's like his awakening moment. And I thought that was really fascinating because it's a, it's a really ballsy thing to do in a movie, whether it's now or 40 years ago, is to sort of look at the concept of sexuality as something that isn't so cut and dry. Because I think so many of us, at least those of us who grew up, you know, decades ago where we're sort of taught, you know, you're either this or you're that. I think there's a case to be made in cruising that really shows that, you know, you aren't just one thing. Um, and I think Steve is a character who thinks he's at one point um, at the beginning of this movie and ultimately by the end of the movie, you know, that's very much not the case. No, I, I in fact, um, I mean, this, this hyper-masculine the hypermasculinity of cruising doesn't only stem from uh, this world he's asked to to go into, but actually it's all the world of cruising, and that includes also the um, police station, the detectives, his colleagues, his um, his superior. I mean, it's it. We notice this hypermasculine universe. Uh, with with ma very hyper masculine worlds within that universe, and but we also know there's a big difference. Um, what it, I think is fascinating is to see how Steve Burns um, is kind of this this foreign body within the police force. He, we never really see him. Friedkin really kind of extrapolates him early on in the film from that world, and we never really see him within it. In fact. We only see him with Captain Edelson, Paul Sorvino's character, um, you know, when the, during their meetings uh, in other parts, in various parts of the city. Uh, when we do see him back in the uh, police station, he's being um, interrogated by his colleagues. Of course, he has to, um, he's been uh, apprehended together with Skip, Skip Lee, uh, which he fingered, to use the word, um, uh, used in the film, um, he uh, he's fingered as a possible as one of you know as possibly responsible of um, of the murders, and he's he has to of course pretend not to be a policeman, and he's being interrogated. And but we notice in Al Pacino's performance that he he does not seem in the game in the dynamic of the of the policeman yeah. there, of the detectives. He is very much scared. He looks he looks worried. He looks scared. And our perception is of somebody that doesn't really fit within that world, but does fit within the cockpit, within the um, within the world he's asked to explore. Um, and there's also, you know, there's always this. Um, um, I always find that William Friedkin's best work is really about um, depicting depicting not necessarily the um, the realism of whatever, you know, let's take to, to Live and Die in LA, To Live and Die in LA, which I think is one of his masterpieces, it's a fantastic film. And To Live and Die in LA is a film in which um, he very, in a very, as usually, usually he always does in his films, French Connection, even The Exorcist, uh, he 
places very very realistic things there's you can tell that he's documented what he's showing us you know it's all there and it's all very real but it also becomes the world becomes very metaphysical and in fact one could would argue that in that film counterfeiting which is you know the, the main crime um that's being investigated within the film counterfeiting becomes um more of a um conceptual conceptual element that ties everything not only the investigation not only willem dafoe's villain but everything within within the film uh emotions are counterfeited they're fake they are reproductions uh, it's not only the money that's being passed from hand to hand but it's or everything um um and 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 so even cruising is very is very much like that i mean it's it's about worlds touching each other but never really overlapping um uh it's it's interesting in fact that um uh, we notice for example one of the few kind of scenes in which we see the victims in their own world um is the role of which is played by um don't remember I, uh, the name slips at the moment but mm, he we see one of the the victims that gets uh, killed in the um in the film booth in the sex shop um he oh, is is that, out- uh, is, is uh, that Martino Perry Martino Perry thank you Martino You're Perry welcome. yes M- Martino Perry we see him coming out of a studio with his assistant um we see we we see uh, him interact and we see normality and but then we see him go into this sex shop um and he becomes like all the people there and i think that's ultimately what what steve burns is that feels is that comforting feeling of a world that is within his universe but it's made out of more precise rules and and ways to interact and um it it ultimately becomes this place where he can feel himself in fact, I've always wondered if this film could have worked with uh, William Friedkin's initial choice for Steve Burns, which was Richard Gere. I thought that was really interesting too, because there's part of me that could see that because you know, as you as, as you guys mentioned in the book, like he has sort of that softer androgynous look to him. Um, but I don't know if it would have been as striking um, because I think it's it's that hardness to Pacino. Um, there's just something about this where I, I gear would have been fascinating, especially coming like with American gigolo and, and things that, like that out there um, in terms of where he was at in his career at this point. Um, but I'm really kind of glad it was Pacino because I think that there's something, especially on a visual of just the, the because they, you know, you guys also talk about the dark doubles and doppelgangers. I think that there's something very striking about Pacino in a lot of ways in this movie. Um, that exactly. I don't and know. I think yeah. Richard Gere is probably, um his good looks would have um i don't know i i feel would have um, made him stand out too much within you know within those wonderful pan shots of the um of the mine shaft richard gear would have stand, you know stood out too much um there's something more livid more real more gritty about al pacino and he is obviously extremely charismatic as we all know but um, he has a realism to him, you, you know, which uh, which is not Hollywood. It's not. Um, it's not. There's 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 a roughness which I feel that works wonderfully in the film, and you know we will never know. But I have a hard time imagining Richard Gere um, uh, giving us that same effect, that same roughness, and managing to really to fit so seamlessly into the folds of a reality like that of the mine shaft. Yeah. And it's funny because I wouldn't say funny, but like, again, rewatching this now, you know, and having not revisited it in like 20 something years, um, just the, the visual imagery in terms of watching Steve go into this club and it's all of these, these guys are really sort of cut from the same cloth. Um, I mean, they, it looks like a family reunion <laughs> sort of because it's, everybody's got dark hair, dark features and I, I never realized like the sameness to 
this world that Steve gets into and how just well he blends into it. Because there's a, there's a lot of characters and a lot of people in this movie that just, they, you look at them and you can tell they've lived a life, if that makes sense. And I think one of my favorite, yeah, I was gonna say one of my favorite things about Pacino is like, you just look at him and look in his eyes and there's, even if he's not implicitly saying anything, you know that there's something there. Um, and I think the softness of gear, I don't know that that world weariness would have come through as, as much as, as it does on Pacino. Um, yeah, no, no, in fact, what there's, uh, I just flipped through the book and yes, in the chapter, which yes, is mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I see exactly what the, this thought, which is uh, I agree with, um, uh, the shadowbound pulsating depths of the club are a tailor-made rabbit hole for our protagonist. Is Burns chosen for the job because he looks like the victims, or is he a stray sheep being led back to its flock? Who are the victims and who are the headsmen to begin with? It's obvious that Friedkin's intention is to blur every border as much as possible, and in doing so, the mine shaft also becomes a metaphysical game space, the sort of frightening yet eerily seducing scenario for our protagonist and the men within it a reflection of Burns' desires and in a tour more, as if we were walking through a carnival hall of distorting mirrors. So yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's interesting um, to see um, to see to see exactly the, how much um, it's also actually uh, what you what you said reminds me also so much about Joe Spinell's character, uh, which I think. Um, I, I talk quite a bit about him in, in the book. I think Joe Spinell, um, I mean, apart from being, you know, a cult favorite, which of course we all know for Maniac and yeah. and Dark Rash and so many other films, but I think Joe Spinell's character, apart from his performance, which I think is very good, um, wonderfully sordid as as uh, and, and and sweaty and, and smelly performance, uh, <laughs> but I think the character, I think the char his character is very fascinating. Uh, because it it really actually shows this he is this invisible this this he he incarnates the invisible bridge between the um, the police force and and uh, with their codes and their uniforms and their leather uniforms and and the world of cruising the world of uh, the cockpit and the mine shaft. And in fact, it's actually, I've always, um, I, I, I said this in the book, it's funny that um, the, the, you know, the police community, the police force has never felt um, strange about, you know, about this, um, about this film, because it actually, I think, says a lot about uh, the state of the, the, you know, Friedkin's perspective on the police. I mean, you've got, um, you've got, uh, repressed, um, uh, repressed homosexuality on many levels within the police um, world because you've got, of course, Al Pacino, but you've got also Mike Starr and Joe Spinell's characters uh, that have this kind of very chauvinistic, very kind of macho attitude, hiding behind their, uh, hiding behind their um, uniforms, but actually, you know, they are. Um, repressed homosexuals themselves they're uh, dealing in a very aggressive and 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 um and um uh, ambiguous and also kind of violent uh violent way about the you know with their sexuality and there's of course the scene with gene davis which is very upsetting it's very it's a very dramatic very violent scene in which he gets molested uh, gets molested by um by these two cops with um, a streetwalker, um, and so you've got that, and then you've got Paul Sorvino's Ed, Captain Edelson, who is this defeated, this defeated uh, man with this kind of deadpan eyes, and uh, Paul Sorvino also adds, I was saying, this wonderful touch of having him limp, which I think really drives home this idea of defeat, and um, to all. Kind of you you actually see how unhealthy one uh, area of the masculine world is, uh, which is of course the police force, and actually how 
how um, um, leveled and how how actually centered the world of the mine shaft is. So actually, at the end of the day, I think if there is um, uh, a kind of an um, um, uh, a pointing a pointing an unhealthy attitude, it's it's definitely towards the police. That's uh, of course doesn't necessarily make um, you know make make the naivety the film has uh, towards the gay community disappear. But I think Friedkin has a lot to say about the kind of the the um, macho attitude and what that represents within the police force. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the Joe Spinell character because what I what I love in in terms of that ambiguity is you know you have him at the beginning when they they you know, pulling those two guys into the car. Um, and then you have um, them sort of telling Paul Servino, hey, these guys from the 6th Precinct are, are doing this stuff. And Servino talks about this idea of, you know, well, there's, I have so many people out there impersonating cops. You know, there's no way my guys are, you know, these guys are doing this. And then we'd never see Spinell again in uniform um, in the movie until the very end of it. Um, and I love that that's sort of that ambiguity because like you see him pop up in different scenes when Steve is, you know, in this world. Um, so you, you know that he's, you know, you know, Spinell is sort of part of, of, of this, this, the homosexual community, in, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of lurking about and kind of, you see him kind of come and go and then you don't see him again until the very last scene um, when Ted is found murdered in his bathroom um, and, he's in, and he's in uniform. And I think again, to me, that was a really genius move on Freakin's part because it really does play up the ambiguity uh, of this film and of who, what these people represent um, in a really, really interesting way. Because again, it's one of those, like Spinell, I could watch forever. Like there's just something, about the way he was able yeah. to do things. He's, there's just never been somebody like him. Um, and I, I wish we were, he was still here so we could kind of, I would have loved to have seen him in his later, like a later phase of his career. Um, but for me, I, he is sort of one of my favorite sort of secondary characters in this movie because you just don't really know with him until the end when Freakin spells it out. But ultimately the pu purpose of that is really to drive home you know, this thing for Sorvino in terms of knowing like, oh my God, that guy was right. This is, this is a real thing. Um, and again, it just adds yeah. to that defeat. But I mean, it's all, it's, it's funny, like everything we, we, we've said actually encapsulates it in the title because cruising can be, you know, it's a, is a term that can be used, um, you know, to describe somebody looking for uh, fast and loose sex, but it can also be a cop car, you know, um, on, uh, on the beach, around, you know, yeah. uh, moving around. So I think that ambiguity is something that is literally from present from the word go. In fact, from the title of the film, um, I think this overlapping of worlds and I think Joe Spinell, you know, kind of really incarnates that overlapping, that bridging is something very fascinating and um and uh, and yes and steve burns is also a cop i feel that is very different from any other cop uh definitely in friedkin's uh, crime universe but also in that period um it's uh, we've got uh, a, a man that is not a man of action uh we we never see him with the, with his gun in his hand um we never see him take charge he's a very passive uh, protagonist um you know he he's an observer he's um he changes things by observing uh but that's you know that's a philosophical um, concept you know if if you look at something you're changing it um but he is very passive so i think i think it's a very different film and i, I usually there's this attempt of kind of labeling it um you know it's it's a kind of a slasher like um thriller that was typical of that time kind of trying to incorporate some you know the, the the slasher genre that was that was kind of gearing up in fact was in you know had 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 geared up already uh, by 1979 then other people have talked about kind of the sordid canon like uh you know the kind of the charles bronson films uh produced by golan and globus in the 80s um kind of adding that kind of 
uh, morbid, sordid sexuality to a cop thriller. People have tried to incorporate this film within currents and subgenres and labeling it, but ultimately it's a thing onto itself. It's a very unique film. No, absolutely. Um, and I, one thing I wanted to talk about, because she's just one of my favorite people, uh, is Karen Allen in this movie. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, this is very much a movie about hypermasculinity, sexual identity, um, and she is very much on the fringes. But that, that doesn't, I don't want to take anything away from her performance, because I don't think that's a detriment to what her functionality in this movie is. Um, and you guys talk in, you guys talk about this in the book, too, in terms of that final scene when Steve comes back to her um, and he's in the bathroom and he's shaving and she puts on, you know, his, his leathers and like puts on the hat and the glasses. And again, it's one of those things like 20 something years ago, I was like, okay, you know, that's interesting. But to me now, like having that perspective in terms of, you know, just studying film and film theory and things like that, things like that, like what a provocative image that is of watching her, sort of transform into like this identity that he's had, you know, when he's been away from her. Um, and to me, that's one of the most striking visuals I think in the movie, because I think it's such a, a very interesting statement on what Steve has gone through in this movie and where he is at that point. Um, and I just thought, again, it's one of those where like some people would see like, oh, Freakins, you know, not doing anything with female characters or whatever, whatever they might be saying about that but I, I one I don't think that this movie was supposed to be about female characters obviously this was something very focused on a, a subsection of, of, of masculine identity um, and I think the way that he uses Karen in this movie is really purposeful um, in a way that sort of really says a lot about Steve without saying too much if that makes sense. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, I um, immediately, when, when we decided to do this book, I immediately asked, I told Marcus that I, would, I, would, I wanted to write a chapter on the um, femininity, femininity or lack of uh, that's present in, um, in the film. I, I think um, what's really interesting, and I believe I mentioned this in the chapter, I actually calculated, I watched the film again, and I calculated when the first female presence, I mean, even even an extra, somebody in the background, anybody, the first female presence appears on screen. And it happens nearly um, 20 minutes into the film, I think 18, I'm going by memory, but I, the, the precise, uh, the precise, um, um i think it's uh, where is it no i want to say that because it it is it's it's almost uh, like 20 minutes in right it's nearly 20 minutes it's like 17 or 18 minutes in and after that i mean first of all the first female character we see is karen allen and after which kind of the female presence kind of flutters around you know, in the borders, but Friedkin does something interesting. He doesn't even use um, female presence, um, even even in kind of your new, usual bridging shots. I mean, I don't know, uh, um, a cashier, um, um, a Waitress. client in a bar, there's nothing. Yeah. Like, there's no female presence whatsoever. And everything, any kind of femininity is tied to the figure of Karen Allen. She, so she is an incredibly, symbolically, she's an incredibly important character within the within the, the film. And what's interesting is that we never see her, uh, except for very, very, like literally a couple of seconds towards the end, and she's not really outside. I mean, she's just at the door opening, opening the front door, looking for her keys, etc. We never see her out into the world. We never see her interacting with anybody, not even on the phone. We don't see her with friends. Uh, Friedkin always places her within that apartment, which we kind of, we kind of imagine it's both their apartments, but it's we never really see him living it. So kind of we associate that apartment really to her. We see her in that apartment always interacting with him. And in fact, I I was I had fun 
And I actually, I, I defined it as cinephile masturbation within the book, but I had fun kind of elaborating this theory that she doesn't exist. Uh, we, I mean, I, you know, this is probably a spoiler alert, but I mean, when we do discover who, well, who at, at, uh, definitely a murderer is, we don't know if he's responsible for all the murders or not. Um, that's, I mean, that's part of the, you know, the whole ambiguity of the ending. But when the uh, the what we imagine at that point that the the person responsible is captured, we 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 discover. I mean, we we realize soon, you know, just just before that that voice we had been hearing throughout the film is his father, the culprit's father, uh, who's been dead for years, and you know he's a projection of uh, you know in a in a way not dissimilar to. Um, Norman Bates's mother is a projection ordering him to do things. And I had fun kind of elaborating the theory that she doesn't exist. You know, we never see her interact with anybody else. Um, and in fact, she's just a fragment of his imagination. And in, and at the end, when she put the, puts on the peaked hat and the, 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 the leathers and the sunglasses, in fact, it's symbolically telling us that that aspect of him, of, of Steve Burns, is being destroyed, is not is non-existent anymore. It's been kind of um, taken over by this other thing, which is represented by the leathers and the peaked hat and the sunglasses. So it's really, she's really has um, a visual function. Narratively, she's important, of course, and but it's not really about what she does or about what she says, more than what, in what context she is placed and what really he, how he interacts with her. So she symbolically, she's an incre incredibly important character. And uh, yeah, and so I had fun, uh, yes, exposing this possible theory about her not existing um, in a way not too dissimilar to um, uh, the father in the film talking to his son and ordering him to, uh, well, to kill. So. Um, so yeah, so no, Karen, and Karen Allen is, you know, is wonderful. I mean, to me, I know many people associate her to, uh, uh, Marion Ravenwood from, from the Indiana Jones franchise, but to me, she is, um, the female lead and, uh, John Carpenter's star man. Me too. That's, that's mine as well. <laughs> yeah, fact, I, mean, I, I actually didn't even see, this is going to sound so, so terrible. I actually never even saw the Indiana Jones original movies until I was, <laughs> so like in my 30s, which is awful. Um, I actually saw Crystal Skull before I ever saw the first Oh my three. God. I know, I know. Blame it, you know, that blame it on my ex. It was not my choice. Um, but yeah, I for some reason I just never really saw those movies. Um, so it's it's a shame of mine. But I've I've corrected it. I've corrected it. Um, but for me, she was always, you know, from Starman, that was like always my favorite role of hers. Uh, Cause my mom, yeah, me, me. I grew up, my mom loved that movie and we watched it so much when I was a kid. Um, so that's what I've always really loved her from. Um, but it was interesting to sort of see her in this and sort of be on the fringes of everything. Um, because I think there, especially in that final moment, it's just, it's, it really does blur that line uh, in a really compelling way. Um, and I just, it was, and I, I, I think your theory is fascinating. Um, I, you know, I'd love to hear Freakin's response to that. Like, I don't know how we get him to respond to that. Um, if he's ever really thought of her in that way of sort of this entity. I don't know. Yeah, sort of this mythological I don't know, no, I'd, I'd be interested uh, in knowing his opinion. Um, but no, I mean, it's uh, Friedkin's um, relationship with the film has always been, as most things attaining to cruising, has always been ambiguous. Uh, so particularly, it would be interesting to know what what he could, what you know, what his thoughts are about such a theory. But um, but yeah, no, it, she, she she is an important character. I mean, the 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 film, I think. Um, uses i mean friedkin uses her a lot i think she's so much tied to editing because when she is when she appears on scene it's very often after a hard cut um we see him for example there's a moment in which we see him in the mine shaft and then there's a hard cut and he is um he's having sex with her and that is really kind of 
vi- it's a really violent change um, in atmosphere and dynamics, but it's also saying something, you know, why is he having sex with her? Is it his attempt to repress what, you know, his new mission uh, is kind of letting leak out? Uh, is it the need for comfort? Is it, you know, what, you know, what's, there's so much behind, you know, that, that editing choice um, conceptually, uh, so, and emotionally. So, so yeah, she's, she's as an important function. Uh, I don't know as an actress, if it was a particularly um, fascinating role uh, to tackle, but definitely narratively and conceptually, she is, um, she has, she's a, a presence of great importance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, the Fast and the Furious are, is happening outside of my house right now. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned, obviously, the editing in the movie. Um, and from the, tech, the, the technical aspects of this movie, there's a lot of interesting stuff because you guys talk about the fact that, you know, because this movie was so highly protested at the time it was being filmed, Freakin had to go in and kind of, I think you guys mentioned, like he had to dub 80% of this movie Yes. Which is insane to me. I can't even, I can't even imagine the logistics of something like that. Um, but I also think it really, in terms of the the sound and the sound mixing and things like that, I think ultimately that sort of, when in a world of hyper-masculinity, having sort of a hyper-real, hyper-realistic soundscape, uh, I think lends itself really well to what Freakin was trying to do here. Um, and I'm just curious if you talk a little bit sort of like diving into the technical parts of this, because um, I like that you sort of discussed sort of the music of of Nietzsche um, and how crucial it was to this film. Um, And also sort of, you know, again, freaking sort of having to make the best of a terrible situation in terms of having to go in and basically reconstruct this movie almost from the ground up uh, on an audio level, because that just doesn't happen. You know, that's just not a thing that we have to do. No, uh, I I think I mean this can be said about most films. Um, I mean it's 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 common knowledge that you know um, you kind of um, you, you shoot the film, but actually you direct the film in the editing suite. Um, you know, really kind of films change and shift and 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 really come together while editing. But I think it's if that's true generically, I think it's particularly true with cruising. It's a film that, um, well, I mean, you 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 said something that I think, you know, attains perfectly to what we're talking about before. Uh, how you know, situations, even sometimes uh, negative or destructive ones, can actually turn out to be um, very fruitless. And I think I think it's the case of cruising. Uh, a lot of its experimental vibe and kind of editing choices and definitely sound design comes from the difficulties during uh, principal photography. And um, and the idea, for example, of this wandering voice um, and, and this overlapping of sounds and kind of also working with the diegetic music and non-diegetic music uh, and really kind of creating a... I think we defined it in the book a um, um, stylized realism um, or a nightmarish realism. I think all that really kind of flourished during post-production, um, and this this idea of kind of confusing the audience. Um, is something that I've never seen exactly like this. And also, for example, the way uh, Friedkin kind of uh, plays around also with different volumes and and uh, uh, points of views of, uh, um, of, of the sound, uh, the squeaking leather being extremely strong at one point, nearly covering uh, the voices and then, uh, the, there's a scene in one of the murders in which there's a music um, that is never clear if it's diegetic or non-diegetic. If somebody's actually in the park listening to it, somewhere is you know within the film it's being played, or if it's instead something that is um, you know it's just like classical non-diegetic soundtrack. So I think a lot of what came you know a lot of the ideas that came out in the, during dubbing and post-production and editing 
uh, really made cruising what it is. Um, what would be interesting, unfortunately, nobody's ever asked this to to Friedkin is, you know, if he was able, if he had been able to direct the film without any kind of uh, interruption or problems uh, or interference, would would we have this film where, you know, would he have had all the ideas he had? Would it be such a complex, uh, from the perspective of sound design, for example, such a complex film? Or would we have had something maybe uh, equally fascinating, but completely different and more um, canonic and more, you know, traditional? Unfortunately, nobody's asked that, uh, but it would be interesting to know his response. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my favorite freaking story that I have is um, I had the chance to cover Killer Joe uh, years and years Fantastic and years ago. Film. It is. It is. That, that movie hit me really hard. It was it was interesting because I saw it at South by Southwest. Um, and the best part was that I was walking into the theater in Austin and Matthew McConaughey bumped into me and he said, oh, so pardon me, miss. And was like that like Southern drawl. And I was like, oh, I'm already hypnotized. Um <laughs> But when they did the junket for Killer Joe, like usually when you do junkets, like you get to go in for an interview and it's maybe 10 to 15 minutes. Like you have to work quick, um, you know, so they're like, OK, you know, we have you for William Friedkin, which I was like, holy crap, this is crazy. Um, and then as I was walking into the room, like I'm thinking I have 10 to 15 minutes and they're like, OK, you have 45 minutes um, and we'll come and get you when when your time is up. And I was like, 45 minutes. And I immediately, like, my stomach dropped into, like, my feet. I was like, what am I going to do with William Friedkin for 45 minutes? Like, that to me was, like, bananas. And it was, like, one of those things where, like, I, you know, we, we got into some really great stuff about Killer Joe. And, of course, we talked about Exorcist because, you know, working with a genre site, it's, it's very pertainable to that kind of stuff. But I was, like, I freaked out internally. I was like, I can't believe I'm sitting in a room with William Freakin. And the best part of it, though, was the fact that when we were done, he wasn't annoyed with me. So that I felt like I could do anything in my career after that because I sat in a room with Freakin for 45 minutes. And he's, you know, he had sort of a reputation where he could get a little prickly at times during interviews. Um, and that never happened with the whole time we talked. But I've never, I've never had an experience like that since, and I now realize like how lucky I was. But there's so many things now in retrospect where I'm like, I have a laundry list of things that I would ask him about um, in terms of just other films and stuff that I'm just, I'm kicking myself that I kind of don't have that that uh, that sort of chance anymore. But I was just, for me, it was like, oh, okay, 10, 15 minutes, and I'm like, no, 45. And I'll tell you, like sometimes 10 to 15 minutes can feel like an eternity, but when you're in there for almost an hour, like. I was I was definitely freaking out um, in a good in a good way, especially once it ended and it actually ended well. So, no, yeah. Well, Friedkin can be. I mean, I've never interviewed him. I've interviewed uh, American directors, but unfortunately, never William Friedkin. But I mean, he has a reputation um, of being at times brutal um, with interviewers. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, congratulations. <laughs> I, sur I survived William Friedkin. That should be like a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I, I'm curious, you know, because I was watching this um, and one of the films that I sort of dove into for Jalloween uh, for a previous mm -hmm. episode of Corpse Club uh, was a film called Knife and Heart. And I was curious, have you seen that? Uh, repeat the title. It's called Knife and Heart. Knife and the Heart. It's an Italian film. Uh, it's actually French. Knife and the Heart. I would have to know the it, the title it came out or the original French title, or the Italian title? Uh, the French title would be Un Couteau dans le, dans le Cure. I had to dig deep into my high school, high school and college French for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's a movie that, um, I, I don't know if you guys have Shudder there, probably not, um, but it's, it's available on Shudder. It's a really interesting, because um, you guys talk about Global Giallo and how this potentially could fit into the, the, the landscape of Global Giallo. Um, yes. But I, it's interesting to me because, again, it had been so long since I watched Cruising and now kind of watching um, Knife and Heart and then watching Cruising, there's a lot of really interesting parallels. So if you haven't seen it, I think you should give it a shot because it's um, basically set in France in 1979 and it's centered around um, this group of people who come together to make uh, homosexual pornography. Um, and there's a killer who's targeting 
uh, actors in sort of this acting group specifically. And it's okay. Really- yes. Now I, I, I went up and looked it up. Okay. Uh, I know, I know of the film. Yeah. Vanessa Paradis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember when it was released. What was it like a couple of years ago? Probably. Couple, yeah. Like two or three years ago. Um, but it's really, there's some really interesting parallels um, between that movie now, like kind of looking at these two movies sort of side by side. Um, that would make for a really interesting study, I think, um, because I think where cruising is sort of at like sort of these harder, grittier elements, there's a softness to Knife and Heart, um, where I think it's like they, they would sort of play yin and yang to each other in a lot of ways. Um, so I wanted to mention in case you hadn't seen it, I think it's something you uh, well, can really check it out. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a movie I hadn't I hadn't watched previous to Halloween. Um, and I realized I wanted to kind of touch on Global Jello. So we did that and we did the editor uh, as sort of a double feature uh, episode. And I was completely struck by what that movie was able to do. So, um, but if for anybody listening, if you've, if you have seen Knife and Heart, I kind of recommend going into cruising and just really sort of looking at how these movies approach similar thematic ideas um, but do in very different ways. But ultimately, I think they're both sort of complementary to each other in some ways as well. Um, it's, it's just it really looks a little bit. It look. I haven't seen the film, but I will watch it. But it looks a little bit like um, that kind of um, uh, stylistic approach of uh, Amer. You know. Yes, I would. I would say that's it. that's that's fairly accurate. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, Definitely interesting. It looks, I mean, the vibes, it the 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 poster kind of emanates from. Um, it's very reminiscent of giallo, Italian giallo from the seventies. So. Um, yeah, I just think it's interesting too because they set it in nineteen seventy nine, which is when cruising was filming. So it's it's that to me, like as soon as like I realized, like you know, okay, cruising came out in eighty, which means it was filming in seventy nine. It was like the all the wheels started turning in my head, and I was like, oh, interesting, how these these two sort of very similar yet very different uh, sort of examinations of of masculinity and with sort of under the giallo lens, I guess, if you will, um, was just really fascinating to me. So I think they would make for a very intriguing double feature. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, so de- I definitely recommend it, and you'll have to report back and let me know what you think. I will. <laughs> I will gladly. I will gladly. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah. No, it's. Um, I mean, I must say. I mean, global. The whole global giallo aspect is something that uh, Marcus feels very strongly about. And I think, um, uh, like, I mean, I really kind of wanted to focus on the. Um, a female aspect of the film, he equally wanted, you know, had, was very passionate about uh, tackling both uh, cruising as a possible horror film and cruising as a global giallo. Uh, I know Marcus has written uh, many, many books about uh, the subject of global giallo. And, um, and yeah, I think, I think it's a strong chapter, the one on global giallo. I think it's, um, it's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I personally have never, um, really connected cruising to the global giallo movement. Let's put it that way. But I think he makes a good case for cruising as a as one of them. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I think for me, like especially after reading the book and that you guys did, um, I, I think you know, for me, I always saw you know cruising as more of a a, a police thriller. Um, you know, with sort of these mystery elements to it. Um, and I think now I sort of land a little bit more in that you definitely, I mean, there's definitely slasher elements to it. Um, there's definitely very much sort of a, a horror through line that's kind of pulsating there, like right under the surface of the movie um, from start to finish. I mean, even the way that the first murder is sort of uh, framed and the way that that plays out is just, it's, it's, a, it's a real gut punch of a moment. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think for me, like, you know, anybody who says like, oh, cruising is horror, like I wouldn't, I don't think I would argue with them at this point. Um, because I think there is definitely a strong case to be made that this could definitely fall within sort of the genre umbrella, uh, of films. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, it's, it's a strongly, I think it, I think it's definitely, um, a very, it has a very strong European vibe within it. 
I mean, arguably, one could one could debate that most of Friedkin's work is very European in many ways. Um, and, and, and he's, you know, he's always been very vocal about how the French, but mostly Italian masters of um, kind of uh, art house, let's say put it this way, just to make the distinction, art house uh, directors like Antonioni, but also Dario Argento have been influential on him. So, um, so there's definitely that experiment, very European experimental vibe to the film. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so, you know, you know, obviously this this book comes out, you know, in a few weeks from when this episode is getting released. And I'm curious, you know, looking at what you guys were able to do with this, um, you know, with this movie and sort of recontextualize it in some really fascinating ways. Um, I'm just curious, what was sort of your biggest takeaway from working on the book? Um, you, did it sort of give you new perspectives into this film? I mean, I'm just curious, like sort of what the process ended up feeling like from you um, in terms of creatively. Um, well, uh, for, for me, this was the very first time I've um, I've uh, focused on one film. Uh, I mean, everything I've I've done, like even now recently, um, I'm working on a new book, uh, and it's darkening the Italian screen. They're all texts that really cover very large periods of time in which you have to kind of encapsulate the meaning the uh, the importance um historical symbolical narrative of a film and and kind of really kind of condense that you can't really focus as much as you want to on one single film uh this is the first time in which i kind of sat down and had to really dissect uh every scene every moment the char- most of all the characters because that's really what i my chapters focus on the the, the characters and their development um so they're kind kind of their arch so to me that was a completely new experience to have to really focus on that because i've never i've never worked as a film critic um so i've always my approach has been more similar to that of film historian so to be able to kind of do that and sit down and concentrate on one film to me was completely new i think marcus had already done it but I, it was something completely new to me and it's it's really particularly fascinating in the case of Cruising is that uh, it's a film that really is is continuously shifting. As soon as you kind of think you have a grasp on it, um, as I was saying before, it kind of, it frees itself from that kind of cage you've put it in. And that's why we we both agreed, me and Marcus, to kind of let the book be very much like the film. Um, we wanted to do something that wasn't really explaining the film uh, as much as trying to interpret it. And I think there's a big difference there. Um, we we placed every possible theory we had, uh, of course, trying to make it as um, as clear and, and 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 structured as possible but we you know i mentioned before the theory about karen allen characters you know not existing um uh, being part of uh, steve burns imagination uh cruising being a horror film we kind of laid down all our thoughts in in an organized way of course and one that's hopefully interesting and entertaining but we didn't really want to kind of limit ourselves in a in a way pro- possibly not too dissimilar to William Friedkin. We, we wanted to kind of uh, focus on various aspects and not really worry if these aspects sometimes um, don't fit together or contradict each other because the film is very much like that. So I think to be able to interpret this film, you have to have a very kind of open mind and um, let the theories flow and then kind of place them next to each other and strangely enough um you in a way in a way the film you you end up understanding you grasp the essence of the film without necessarily making perfect sense of everything within it um and you know you have a lot of questions at the end of the film uh, both attaining to what Friedkin was attempting to do, was attempting um, to kind of to portray, but also to the narrative of the film. So it's, is Steve Burns a killer, et cetera, et cetera. And 
but you kind of you you understand the film where it's coming from and you have a feeling which i think is is um is very specific it's not a general feeling you know you it's a cruising feeling you get that feeling only by watching cruising and you figure out the film you understand the film um and we wanted to do something similar uh of course you know within you know as much as possible when it comes to an academic text we wanted to kind of capture that essence of being able to talk about something without trying to label it too much without trying to be too restrictive with ideas but letting everything flow and hopefully once you finish reading the book you kind of have ideas you know you have you you we put you in a place where you can think about things you might not agree with us and you might actually think that we at times even contradict contradict um, each other but it kind of gives you some tools some extra tools and and you can come up with your own theory about the film and how you feel about it. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, I it's funny because like sometimes like I'll do Corpse Clubs episodes and I'm like, you know, I just kind of wing it. I just kind of go with it. Um, but I was like actually taking notes like while I was reading the book and stuff because it was just it was one of those where like as I'm reading things like things are clicking because I just watched the movie and I was like, oh, well, this and that. Um, so I think it really is gives a lot of food for thought. And I think the way that you guys sort of present things in a way that, you know, ultimately strengthens a lot of aspects of the movie for me. Um, but also, as you mentioned, sort of opens you up in terms of some other possibilities and some other things that you may not have thought about. Um, and I think that's what I really liked about it was just that, you know, it really, you know, I like I like books that kind of have me walk away from them and give me food for thought. Um, and they sort of stick with you and they they kind of like keep rolling around in your brain a little bit. And I think this one really did. Um, so congratulations mm -hmm. to you guys. I think you guys Thank did a really you. fantastic Thank you. job. No, I mean, we just... Uh... Uh, the last thing, I mean, we that one of the, the the reasons why we kept the book relatively short. I mean, it is short. It's not relatively short. It's short. A short book was because we didn't want to overdo things. Uh, we didn't want to, um, uh, you know, overflow. I mean, we wanted to keep things direct and as simple as possible. Uh, some concepts are difficult to to to. Um, to keep simple but we tried as as much as possible and we wanted a book that um in which you could you could actually remember everything or most the concepts at least macro concepts um because i mean when it comes to writing it's very easy to write you know you, on cruising you could write tons of books you know there's so much to say and you know you can just flow keep the flow going with theories and, and anecdotes but at one point it becomes too much and we didn't want to do that kind of book where it's just it just overdo uh, overdoes it overdo overdoes it yes so we wanted to keep it um direct and and graspable in a way at least at least as far as how much a person can actually absorb you know yeah definitely um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. A, I, I'm not great at talking. I, I my medium is more writing. I, that's uh, where I'm comfortable for. So, well, so let, I find it always very hard. Let me let me put your mind at ease because you did fantastic here. I know you said this is the first time you've done one of these, um, and it's been a real pleasure for me um, having you on to talk about this. Um, mm -hmm. And we should definitely do this more in the future because I think um, I'd love that. I'd yeah, love you that. just yeah. Oh, let me just say, say one thing that yeah, for sure. The unsung, the unsung hero of this book is my very patient girlfriend that uh, is British, and she uh, proofread and corrected and kind of followed the making. So I want to thank Ellen for this book. As awesome. Well. <laughs> yes, it's always it's always a, a good thing to sort of uh, give credit in, in those instances, because, uh, you know, it's, it's just as somebody I know is like who's I wrote, a you know, as, a, as somebody who's also written a book, um, although not nearly as fascinating uh, as <laughs> what you've been able to do with your two books that I've read so far. Um, but just having that support system is crucial, especially when you have somebody with a good eye who can go through and kind of look at everything. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Um, but for those those of you listening at home, uh, cruising 
which comes out, um, I'm pulling up the info again because I'm a goof, uh, comes out from Devil's Advocates on November 30th. You can already pre-order the book uh, here in the United States uh, on Amazon's website. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, it's a really fascinating read. It's a quick read as well. So for those of you who might be intimidated, um, it's it, I basically got through it in one night and I'm already ready to dive into it again. Um, <laughs> You know, but for those of you listening, um, we, we do appreciate your support here at Corpse Club. Um, and for all your daily news, reviews, and interviews, and more, you can check us out over at dailydead.com. Uh, once again, Eugenio, uh, thank you so much for joining us this week. And, uh, Grazie a voi. <laughs> and for those of you, uh, you know, uh, listening at home, stay scary. Thank you.